child. They're pretending. She's called you around the touch her. Mary, do you send the shit alive? Oh, save me. I freeze. I freeze. There's a wind. I'm being tired. Mary, woman, do you witch her? I say to you, do you send your spirit out? 1206. Let me go. I cannot. Father, and, oh, how do you call heaven whore? Whore! And, and what do you mean? It is a whore! Mr. Danforth, he is lying. Parker, now you will suck a screen to set me with. This will not pass. I have known her, son. I have known her. He confesses. John. You. You are a lecher. John. You cannot say oh. such Francis. Francis, I wish you could have some evil in you that you might know me. A man will not cast away his good name. You surely know that. In, in what time? In what place? In the proper place. Where my beasts are bedded. On the last night of my joy, some eight months past, she used to serve me in the house, sir. A man may think God sleeps, but God sees everything. I know it now. I beg you, sir. I beg you. See her what she is. My wife. My dear good wife took this girl soon after, sir, and put her out on the high road. And being what she is, a lump of vanities. Excellency, forgive me, forgive me. She, she thinks to dance with me on my wife's grave, and well she might, for I thought of her softly. God help me, I lost it. And there is a promise in such sweat, but it is a whore's vengeance, and you must see it. I set myself entirely in your hands. I know you must see it now. And the care Williams, you deny every scrap and tittle of this. If I must Twelve or seven. That, I will leave and I will not come back again. I have made a bell of my honor. I have won the doom of my good name. You will believe me, Mr. Danforth. My wife is innocent. Mr. Paris, go into the court and bring good wife Proctor out. Your honor, this is all. Bring her out. And tell her not one word of what's been spoken here. And let you knock before you enter. Now we shall touch the bottom of this swamp. Your wife, you say, is an honest woman. In her life, sir, she have never lied. There are them that cannot sing and them that cannot weep. My wife cannot lie. I have paid much to learn it, sir. And when she put this girl out of your house, she put her out for a harlot. Aye, sir. And knew her for a harlot. Aye, sir, she knew her for a harlot. And if she tell me how to deal it for the harlotry, may God spread his mercy on you. Hold! Turn your backs, both of you. Now let neither of you turn to face Goody Proctor. All right, so this is going to be the compelling scene of the, of the play, so let's uh, analyze it quickly. Notice how this thing deteriorates. It's a simple question to Mary Warren. Hey, if you were faking before, you can fake now. Fake! And Mary Warren will say, I can't, I can't do it. Of course, this is the power, let's say it, this is when that psychological reading and that sociological reading come together. She can only fake it. She can only have these kind of crazy moments when she has all of the other girls participating as well. Group hysteria. Of course, we'll have group hysteria between the girls. We'll have group hysteria within the entire town of Salem on, on different levels. So Mary Warren can't do it. Abigail Williams steps in and is immediately able then to start to play the game again of pretending like these evil spirits are coming into her. That will lead Proctor to step forward and say, I slept with this girl. Now, of course, in Puritan culture, notice Danforth just said it, if it is true that the two of you messed around and hooked up, then everything Abigail Williams has said completely discredited, and Abigail Williams knows it. Note the irony at the top of page 1207. When Danforth asks her if it's true that she slept with, with Proctor, did you notice this? Abigail Williams says, if I must answer that, I will leave and I will not come back again. Notice she doesn't deny it. She just says, I am not answering your question. To which, it's pretty simple now. Now the play will come to its end, won't it? We're going to have the judges there. We're going to have Abigail Williams standing there. We're going to have John Proctor standing there. Simple. We bring in Elizabeth. Elizabeth's going to come in and Elizabeth's going to be asked a simple question. Did your husband sleep with Abigail Williams and is that why you got rid of her? And all Elizabeth has to do is say, yeah, that's how it worked. Of course, it's pretty easy because why? She never lies. That's central. She never lies. Proctor will say in her whole life, 
She has never told a lie. The woman is incapable of lying. Therefore, whatever it is that she says, you can take it for the truth. And the irony of all ironies will be now that all three parties will be standing finally in a room together. And Elizabeth, all she has to do is tell the truth. Of course, at the moment when she's asked, did your husband sleep with this girl? And is that why you got rid of her? She will decide for the first time in her life to lie. Let's write it down. This will be the central irony of the play. At the very moment that she lies, she's doing it, of course, to save her husband. But, of course, in the moment of her lying, she will, in fact, do her husband. And, of course, a good number of people as well, because obviously she's going to lead, uh, leave Abigail Williams capable of retaining her power. Out of this will come the end of the act and the complete insanity to follow. Let's go to work with it. No one in this room is to speak a word or raise a gesture, I or me. 12.07. Bottom of 12.07. Mr. Chiba, report this testimony in all exactness. Yes. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. Come here, woman. Look at me only, not at your husband. In my eyes only. Good, sir. We are given to understand that at one time you dismissed your servant, Abigail Williams. That is true, sir. For what cause did you dismiss her? Why did you dismiss Abigail Williams? She, uh, well, wait. dissatisfied me and my husband. In what way dissatisfied you? She will... Woman, look at me. Was she slovenly lazy? What disturbance did she cause? Your Honor, I... In that time, I was sick, and I... My husband is a good and righteous man. He is never drunk, a summer and a wasting his time at the shovel board, but always at his work. She but doesn't want to hurt his reputation, sick. right? Sir, I were a long time sick after my last baby. And I thought I saw my husband somewhat turning from me. I, and this girl... Look at me. Yes, sir. Abigail Williams. What is Abigail Williams? I came to... I think he fancied her. And so one night I lost my wits, I think, and put her out on the high road. Your husband, did he indeed turn from you? My husband is a goodly man. Then he did not turn from you. Look at me. He... To your own knowledge, has John Proctor ever committed the crime of lechery? There's the question. Answer my question. Is your husband a lecher? No, sir. Remove her mouth. Remove her eyes. Remove her. Tell the truth. Elizabeth, I have confessed it. She only thought to say my name. Excellency, it is a natural lie to tell. I beg you, stop now, before another is condemned. I may shut my conscience to it no more. Private vengeance is working through this testimony. From the beginning, this man has struck me true by my oath to heaven, I believe him now. And I she's spoken call back history, and this man has lied. Well, so here we go. We've got a situation where to protect her husband's reputation, notice how she keeps saying, my husband is a good guy, my husband is a good guy. To protect her husband's reputation, she will lie. In the moment that she lies, she of course dooms John Proctor because Proctor has already told the truth. Notice Hale, and this will be kind of the end of it for him. Hale says, it is a natural lie to tell. In other words, she was trying to protect her husband, right? I beg you, stop now before another is condemned. I may shut my conscience to it no more. And then finally Hale says it. The truth of what's going on in Salem. Private vengeance is working through this testimony. From the beginning, this man has struck me true by my oath to heaven. I believe him now, and I pray you call back his wife before we... And then Danforth says it. She spoke nothing of lechery. This man is alive. End of discussion. Whoa. By the way, just for a moment on 1208, read with me in the literature and in context information history connection. Read with me uh, there on 1208. One of the many characters in the Crucible who have real historical counterparts is John Hawthorne, a judge who takes part in the Salem witch trials. The real Hawthorne's most 
famous descendant was the writer Nathaniel Hawthorne, who lived in Salem during the 19th century. Hawthorne used the Puritan colonies of his ancestors as the setting for much of his work. In Puritan rigidity and repression, he found an expression for his dark vision of the human soul. Hawthorne's best-known novel, The Scarlet Letter, examines the repressive side of Puritanism and the hypocrisy and pain that such an atmosphere produced. His short stories, Young Goodman Brown and The Minister's Black Veil, also focus on New England's Puritan communities. We, of course, study the uh, Minister's Black Veil together in junior English. Connecting to literature, the question is, what inspiration for Hawthorne's dark vision may have come from his Salem ancestor? All right, so now we're going to turn to the very end. And, of course, we've got to have Abigail Williams. Abigail Williams has got to somehow regain control at the end of the third act. And John Proctor is going to himself be condemned. But before he goes, he's going to make a powerful statement. Let's take a look at how this thing unfolds. Believe him. This girl has always struck me for Oh, my God. 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 Oh,
The confession, ironically, is going to doom Proctor, even though it's complete falsehood. But the question is, why does she do it? And the simple answer is, she has no other way to save her life. The only way she's going to keep from being hanged is to say, uh, John Proctor is, is, is the devil, and Mary uh, and, and Abigail Williams is not. And it's really kind of that, it's really kind of that simple, right? In the meantime, we've got this exchange that will happen at the bottom of 12.12. Let's look at it. Danforth will accuse Proctor. You are combined with Antichrist, are you not? I've seen your power. You will not deny it. What say you, mister? And then, of course, Proctor's response is, I say, God is dead. And, of course, in that moment, that's all it takes. He is now accused, He's now kind of convicted himself of atheism. And in that moment, it's all over. Hale tries to say that this is, uh, this is not, I mean, this is insane. What's going on here? Can you not see what's going on? But notice Danforth, he's very driven to find the answer. He has a certain kind of pride or hubris that will not allow him to imagine that any of this is a contrivance. Notice Proctor says it at the very bottom of 1212. Again, we're coming back to the, the topic, the, the title of the Blake Crucible. He says, a fire, a fire is burning. I hear the boot of Lucifer, Satan. I see his filthy face, and it is my face and yours, top of 1213. It's very possible that of all the lines of the play, when the play was performed in 1953, that viewers were most offended by, it's very possible that these were the lines maybe they were most offended by, because here it is, he says it, when Americans watched what was happening with McCarthy and all of these hearings going on. It was the face of evil. It was the face of Lucifer. And we're all guilty. Both McCarthy, who brought all these people in front, and the rest of America, who stood by and watched it, is almost a type of entertainment. And notice he says, we're all there. Danforth, for them that quail to bring men out of ignorance as I have quailed, and as you quail now when you know in all your black hearts this be fraud. God damns our kind especially, and we will burn. We will burn together. Whoa. Compelling lines. And this is a, a reason why this play becomes later, historically, such an interesting study. Because when the people watched this play for the very first time on Broadway in 53, they knew exactly what Miller was doing. In the air, in the political air of the day, everyone knew what was going on with these blacklist trials and all of this. And a lot of people stood by and said nothing because they didn't want their name named. They didn't want to be involved. They wanted to somehow protect themselves. So when he says we all burn together, these lines are going to be read and interpreted in compelling ways. Of course, finally, Hale, will, Hale quits the court and he says, this is garbage. I'm done with it. All right, at the end of Act 3, then, let's go ahead and now take some quick notes at Level 2 and Level 3 so that we can uh, finish our annotative work. Of course, at 2A, you've got all kinds of major themes messages happening here. Notice, of course, the idea of telling the truth, truth-telling versus lying. The irony of all ironies, of course, is going to be that Mama's not going to tell the truth for the one time in her life, and it's going to be the, it's going to be the end of everything. It's going to doom everything. Notice we have another major theme here, and this reminds us in some ways of the greatest, what Aristotle considered to be the greatest of the, of, of the uh, Sophoclean plays, Oedipus Rex, where Oedipus in that story, we've lectured on this in another lecture, Oedipus in that, in that play, he wants to do the right thing. I'm going to get to the bottom of this, and of course Danforth, he's so driven, he's so clearly myopic on just doing his job that he cannot see anything else outside of his range of vision, and of course... That's all the real stuff that's actually going on, and he cannot see it. It totally is beyond his ability to see. That is to say, you think you're doing something right when, in fact, you're doing the complete opposite. It's something that's really, really wrong. Okay? Another major theme. People can be manipulated because of their fear into believing that they see things, into believing that they are uh, in experiencing things, as Mary Warren does. The power 
of peer pressure. Let's just write it down that way, right? The power of peer pressure. We will ask at 3B here in a second. When was the last time you were in a situation where, are you ready for this? You did something you knew was wrong. You did something you didn't want to do, and you did it anyway because you were too afraid that somebody might laugh at you, somebody might hold you up to, to ridicule, somebody might say something about you, ruin your reputation or whatever. Of course, we'll come back to it one more time. The power of reputation leads Goody Proctor, Elizabeth, to actually lie for the first time in her life because she's trying to defend her man. And in the process, she takes him down. While we're there, so let's go ahead and say it in 2B. This is dark, dark irony. Both situational verbal irony as well as dramatic on stage irony. We want Elizabeth Proctor to tell the truth. She's always told the truth. We want her to stand up and say, my husband slept with Abigail. That's what's going on. This is not complicated. And in the moment when she can do it, she doesn't do it. She says, no, 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 he never slept with her. Bam. And of course, notice what happens. The minute that she does it, Proctor will say, Elizabeth, I already told him, I confessed. And her comment is, oh God. She knows. She realizes. In a single moment in this play, everything turns. And she realizes, we're all jacked. Ugh. And there's no going back. There's no way of, you know, kind of, going back and saying, oh, no, 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 I'm I, I, I changed my mind, I changed it, can't do it. And Danforth believes he's totally in the right. The compelling power of onstage dramatic irony. Let's jump to level three and three uh, A, other texts we can maybe compare to this text. Think about a title for you, a text, a play, a film, uh, a song, that brings into close focus this notion of peer pressure. Someone doing something in spite of the fact they don't want to do it. The power of worrying that somebody is going to maybe make them feel dumb, maybe going to hurt their reputation, and so they do it. Is there a text for you that kind of...